Terry. I work as a, uh, an epidemiologist or a methodologist at the uh, University of Applied Science uh, in Amsterdam. And um, I also have a, a rather small appointment still at the Amsterdam Medical uh, University Hospital. Um, but as this talk will make clear, that that is a rather symbolic appointment still. Um, this talk will be not so much on uh, whistleblowing. I think it's basically a case of um, um, harassment. I think that, that is what I uh, what I feel about this case. Uh, but you know, there I'm not coming here as an expert. I think there's experts in, in the audience, so I'm probably here to to learn uh, during the, the discussion uh, a lot. So um, this talk is about my reflections on being a passionate uh, researcher on the issues of this very conference. I will show you a couple of illustrations. And um, getting to grips with a uh, change of uh, leadership in our department that, that turned out to be uh, quite dramatic. Um, so my passionate, uh, being a passionate scientist about the themes of this conference are illustrated by uh, being raised as a systematic reviewer getting very um, sensitized to the, uh, a big problem that the, uh, a large part of the medical literature is actually very biased, which is a big problem uh, because we use that, that international literature to base our uh, care decisions on. And um, so I think it's, it's very irritating that, that we let this publication bias uh, business uh, proceed. And that's something that, that I'm passionate about, and I published uh, some work about it. Um, the second thing is about um, the acknowledgement of limitations. I was glad to see that from Norway that also ranked pretty high. Um, and that's also uh, uh, something that, I, uh, that I'm quite passionate about, too, that we should do something about it. Um, so, so much for the, for the passions uh, of the themes of this conference. A little bit more about my background, because I think it is I think it's uh, important for you to understand that I was, I, from my perspective, I was actually doing a very good job at the hospital, not only for the department but also for the for the wider hospital. So uh, skipping the, the, the old-fashioned uh, uh, metrics, which are also you know pretty okay. Let me let me tell you a little bit about about the modern metrics. So in, in 2016, I, I won a prize uh, uh, on societal impact for a part of my uh, work. I, I was building, and I also really had a reputation in the hospital of organizing a transdisciplinary um, uh, workshops and symposia where through the international um, uh, exchange program I could uh, invite really interesting people like uh, Kate Dickerson, um, Malcolm McLeod, uh, Steve Goodman, some of the of you in the audience may know these people. These are people who are actually, it's quite strange that they are not at this conference because they, they do work that is very central to the themes of this conference. Um, to give you one example, Kay Dickerson's out actually the inventor of pre registration of clinical trials back in the, 19, in the 1980s. Um, I was and still am quite active in teaching uh, uh, responsible conduct of research uh, activities uh, in the university and the graduate school of the hospital. Of course, as a, as a, a PI, I was mentoring, co-mentoring uh, PhD students, and um, it was quite interesting uh, because that was a thought that would be an interesting met metric to go to the acknowledgments of theses and papers, and I would come back because I will I will actually end on a positive note uh, in this uh, talk, uh, talking about a phenomenon that I would like to define as the academic assist, uh, talking about basketball, um, which is also uh, dear to me. Um, the academic assist would be something to uh, think about a little bit more. But I also had two uh, big problems. I was not writing enough grants, and um, I was I asked for a little bit of space, let's say, in the Google philosophy of give the guy some space to do what he's passionate about, and it will probably cross-fertilize uh, all of his work. Um, that was also a problem in, in the situation I was working on. I was working in a, in a clinical department. So in, in, this actually, over the last eight years, this, this story developed. So it's actually started in 2011 when a new uh, a leader for the department was appointed. Then um, the, the weather turned pretty uh, dark uh, 
not so long ago, um, when, when things exploded. And why did things explode? Um, I had a role in that too, because the, the real conflict started in 2011, 2012, and I think I was harassed, although I didn't call it that way. Um, but it, then, it, you know, I got seconded to other institutions, institutions and departments. But in 2017, I was actually uh, successful in getting some grants, but it was for research integrity uh, topics. And that was completely unacceptable. But you must understand that as a PI from the type of by statistics methodology, it's very hard to get grants for clinical uh, topics. So for me, it's quite essential to get the grants for things that I'm passionate about and I'm knowledgeable about. So, so, so these things about grant getting and, um, and, and these passions are, are connected. So only uh, I think four or five weeks ago, this report came out in, in the Netherlands. Um, it is a, an anthropological study about harassment in academia, um, but it was commissioned by the Dutch network of women professors. Um, so it's an anthropological study with 53 um, female scientists of various uh, seniorities. And um, to me, that was really illuminating because if you take out, let's say, let's say, the sexual um, harassment that are very prominent in this report, to me it was the power structure and, and, and the, let's say the line of the stories in this report was like, wow, this had happened to me, but it never occurred to me to call that harassment. And I, I think that, that was, I felt really naive about that because, you know, I'm a pretty senior guy already. Right? Um, so in this report, uh, they, they have like seven dimen uh, dimensions uh, of, of harassment. And for some of the experts in, in this audience, probably um, it's nothing new, um, but I, I'll call them, uh, I'll read them out anyway. Scientific sabotage, sexual harassment, physical verbal threats, uh, denigration, also in public, uh, exclusion, and, and uh, not facilitating special needs. So I think in, in my special case, uh, there are only five, which is still enough to be uh, uh, miserable for some time. but. Um, I think for the sake of time, I won't go into the details of what exactly happened. I mean, if, if you're interested, I could, uh, you know, elaborate on that a little bit more during the discussion. Um, then there's another interesting issue that was also very prominent in that report commissioned by this uh, committee of, of, of women um, scientists, uh, professors in the Netherlands, is people start looking for help. And I did the same thing. I, I talked to a lot of people in the hospital. To, to find a solution because it would have been really, I think, really easy to find a compromise. Uh, because I just was asking for some space for these for these passions and following these leads, um, and uh, I think I wasn't asking to do that full time. So I think if there had been one person in the hospital with some authority and said, "Let's sit at the table, discuss this, and and we can solve this," I think that would have been so reasonable. But it got completely out of hand, and to me, I think it was very unnecessary. So, um, just giving you one illustration, even at the stage where, where uh, official mediation uh, occurred, I was still tolerated during the mediation, uh, you know, to be denigrated uh, quite a bit, which to me was, you know, very uh, startling. Going back to the report, um, the anthropological study, it's to me, it was revealing to see that um, out of 35 of these uh, uh, female scientists, only one was actually receiving adequate help. And that brings me to the structure of, of our academic um, work climate, at least in the Netherlands. Um, people looking for help. There are dozens of people that actually, or it's, or it's their official job, or you talk to people um, uh, rather high up in the uh, in the tree of authority, but it's ping ponging around, this is from the report, of people happened more often, and research participants in this study reported hearing from, for example, the confidential advisor, the integrity committee, the <coughs> department, the dean, that it was not their task to intervene. And so that's indicating that there is no adequate support system in place. And that, that was very uh, recognizable. 
So it's a session about whistleblowing. I don't think I qualify as a whistleblower, or if I qualify, it was very successful. There were actually two very good colleagues of mine, um, a senior uh, a woman scientist and, and, and a very good uh, uh, colleague of mine, uh, uh, a guy. Um, she went to the uh, confidential advisor uh, when she felt arrest. This this guy was uh, this guy was at some point crying in my office after being arrested by the same guy, by the same boss. Uh, I think it was quite special that all three of us were in the same position in that department. We were all um, we it all had been head of research of that department. Um, I was pushed aside. The others left that position out of free will because they were so frustrated by by. Um, the way they, they had been managed. Um, so in the end, uh, the, the leader had to take up that um, role himself, but he didn't have any time to do that, uh, realistically. In terms of whistleblowing, we actually drew up a plan to, to work together. But of course, it is very difficult. And I think in the end, we or I was unsuccessful to really get them to to do that together. So in the end, I ended up alone. I don't blame them for that because it's not an easy thing to do um, in, in, a, in an environment of you know, uh, fear. So I had to do it on my own, and that was not that successful. So coming to uh, the first conclusion, before I move on to the positive part, uh, which is about the academic assist, I think that effective harassment policies are actually needed. I think we should select, uh, find ways to select our leaders more carefully and also provisionally and provide mentorship training and not only provide the training but also monitor the effects of those trainings, of those trainings. And, and perhaps via the, the um, workplace climate assessment and let that play a role in the accreditation. I think that would be quite effective. Drawn on my own experience, I think it would have been good if I had realized that there is this term of harassment um, and to teach young scientists the, the different manifestations of that because it may not have changed the situation a lot, but to, to have, a, let's say, a more or less technical term, know that there's a literature on it, it, it might have given some support, at least uh, psychologically. And finally, I think we should design a coherent alarm and support system at our institutions that can also act on patterns. Because if three people from the same department come with quite similar stories within a relatively short time frame, to me it's quite unacceptable that these are all like different cases. Um, but that appears to be a problem to, to detect the pattern. And it may be detected, but there's no action on it. So, ending on a positive note, and it has to do with my role as a, as a team scientist more than as a, as a, as a leader in all the projects. Because biostatisticians or methodologists are very often in that position. So in basketball, uh, to, uh, to come back to, to Joe, an uh, assist is defined, uh, maybe defined as a, a pass of such high quality that another player can score simply. So let me define the academic assist as an advice of such high quality that a colleague's uh, scientific product gains much extra value. Now. There's an interesting paper I, uh, I found it quite recently by, by an American colleague, uh, Alex Atto. And what he tried to solve is the following problem. Suppose I do an experiment. I have a large set of research teams. I'm going to randomize that set of research teams either to a PI that is very helpful, or I'm going to randomize the other half of the teams to a PI that's completely not helpful. What would be the effect of that intervention to the to the quality of the work of those teams. Now, you won't be surprised that such an experiment does not exist. Um, so we have we found a, a way around that. And how did he do it? He looked at acknowledgement. Very interesting. He looked at a massive um, pile of acknowledgement and looked at names of people who got acknowledged. Then he looked at another massive pile of documents and he looked at people, PIs, that died had died mid-career. He connected those two sources and he found 149 PIs that had been that died had died mid-career. And he looked at 
the consequences of, let's say, the teams that they had been working with, what were the consequences downstream after these people had died? And the 149 PIs that had died, he, he subdivided those in four different types. I think that's quite interesting because you can divide them over uh, the, the two dimensions. They're all productivity, and he had a very high standard. They had to be in the in the five percent highest position in the people, and about helpfulness, whether you would occur uh, on a regular basis in these um, acknowledgments. So there are four different types, as you understand. For the all stars, they, they score a, a plus on, on both conditions. For the lone wolves, they are very productive for themselves, but they're not very helpful. Uh, not appearing in the acknowledgments. For the mavens, I would consider myself a maven. Maybe that's arrogant, but that's how I consider myself. You know, not even the top five scoring scientists, they're pretty helpful. And then, of course, you have the people who don't qualify for either of them. And this is what he found. So, after a healthy PI dies mid career, their co authors experience a dramatic decline in high impact publications and citations. So, he took the old metrics, but you know, we can't change that. In contrast, there's no significant change in these uh, uh, metrics for co authors of the unhelpful PIs. I thought it was actually a very uh, interesting paper. I will skip for the sake of time, the other patterns are pretty much the same for publications and citations. So, ending. I think better recognition for team scientists is actually warranted and needed. Um, and I recommend you, uh, you know, the, the, this paper by Mazumdar and colleagues about the proposal um, to do just this. Um, with that, I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much.